So here's uh, the puzzle. This took me a little over two minutes to do, so this is more moderate in difficulty. Uh, on a puzzle like this, there are a lot of things that jump out to me when, when I get started. Uh, if you look at this puzzle, you already have six of the, the nine digits in, in the third row and the seventh row filled in. And so you already can tell what these three digits must be. You may have to go through it. So one, you need a two somewhere. So I'll even write on the side. I won't do this, but maybe as a starting solver, it's useful to put this information somewhere. You need a six, you need a seven. And so we'll come back, maybe use that information later on. Down here, we need a two, we need a three, and we need a four. And so one thing you could try to do in solving this puzzle is to see if you can just fill in these three digits, because they're pretty uh, important. Something that's true, though, is that if you know what these three digits are, you know what those two digits are, because they're the ones that aren't these. So we have a one, we have a two, we have three, four, five, six, seven. So this is an eight, and this is a nine. And if I just look below, that's an eight, and that's a nine. And so my eye, when I first started this puzzle, was saying this box and this box are places I could make a lot of progress. If I follow up down here, I can fill in the rest of this box. And once I've filled in that, there's a seven, there's a two, and a six. And so just in those two areas, I've placed all the digits. I don't know if in the solving video that's exactly where I started or got to, but we can do that. We follow it up. These columns have only one thing left, and so we might as well fill in those numbers. And now we're in a case again where we have a column that has three things missing, and those are a two, a six, and an eight. Just so happens we have a two and an eight. So what's left is that six. And so that's just one place to get started is looking there. Now, we haven't looked at all at the other parts of the puzzle. One other thing that stood out to me when I first looked at it is that, again, I don't know why it's always the ones, but there are six ones in this puzzle. So you already have two-thirds of the numbers you're meant to get. And if you, you may even just do the sample yourself. Go through one through nine, see what numbers you see a lot of. I see a lot of ones. And so if I follow this up, I have two in this column. I need to put a number up here. I've got that one, so there. One of the three that are left is gone. Uh, all these are filled in. Let's look at the bottom. There are two. One of them has to go here. That one goes there. And when you have eight numbers, you can always get the ninth one. It's going to be the row in the column that you haven't used, which is that row and that column. And so just by looking at that digit, I've placed all the, all the ones that are there. Uh, let's see what else stands out. So now often in this kind of situation, I would look for a place I have a lot of things left, uh, not a lot of things left to fill in. And in this case, something that strikes me when I just look at the puzzle, I see this 5-4 and this 5-4, and these block two positions. There needs to be a 5-4 up here, and so I can just fill that in, trickle it up, that this is sort of copied over. And as you make these kinds of, of leaps or these kinds of observations, you can you know, feel free to move around the puzzle and, and, uh, and, and make progress. One thing that if, if you're working on a real hard puzzle, this is not a, a real hard puzzle, but as, as an example, uh, Whenever you write a number, if you've been stuck for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and in my case it might be two or three minutes, but however long you're stuck, when you write a number that you're sure of, it probably leads to something down the line which you should look at. So let's say I wrote this number five, which is a correct placement here. Here are the kinds of steps I'm going on in my mind. I'm looking for if this gives me another five. So I'm looking to the right. I already have those fives. I'm looking up. This doesn't give me a five, but I'll put that note in. The other thing is I'm looking if this is filled in this row, this column, or this box usefully. In this case, putting this 5 in has left only two things left for me to fill in. So I'll put in this 8 and this 2 next in the sequence. And now I've put an 8 and 2. I have to choose which to keep in mind. Oftentimes, if I'm going too fast, I'll forget what I've done. But this 8 sort of has now made this box real tempting. Again, there are three digits here that we could fill in. We need a 2, a 6, and a 4. I can place this 2. I can't do much over here. But it, it's the two things. When you place a number, look for that number outside the box. But at the same time, look for what you might have been able to do inside of the box as well. And so it's going between different ways of thinking or ways of visualizing it. I, I, I do this almost automatically, but it's in part what I think gives me so much speed is that I'm jumping, jumping between different modes uh, real fast. And so I can come over here, 379, 37. You know, what I'm doing is probably not what what's going to be easy for you to replicate. But these sort of simple steps of how you want to approach a problem, how to focus in on an area like we did at the start, where you can probably get all the digits early, like those are the things you want to start looking at, which I feel most people solving the puzzle don't do. They just treat every puzzle the same and always start at one, always go to two, and so on. Puzzles have their own unique character. In this case, these 
these rows here were the unique character that I chose to just just go after, and and you know that this this ended up taking me 223, but it should probably take you 10 or 15 minutes.